Good evening. I am Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp near Boston. And with me in Virginia? I'm Carrie Lynn, the director of the Pursuit of History. And we have with us tonight, Alex Kane. Thank you for joining us, Alex. Thank you very much for having me. So Alex is uh, an author. He's been a speaker at History Camp. And uh, if everything goes well, he's going to be a speaker at History Camp this summer. Uh, Alex, tell us about the two really interesting areas and perhaps kind of overlooked areas that you have focused on in your research and your writing. Sure. Um, I have been um, focusing probably for about the last five years uh, on the civilian experience uh, in warfare during the American Revolution. Uh, particularly, I focused uh, my first research project, if you want to call it that, uh, was on the uh, experience of loyalist refugees in Canada uh, following the Burgoyne invasion of 1777. And then starting about 2017, uh, when I started working on an interpretive project with Minuteman National Park uh, in partnership with Jim Hollister, uh, the inter head interpretive ranger, I started doing a research project and in, in delving into the civilian experience of, of what the people, the men and women and children uh, went through who were not combatants during uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord. You know, when I sat in your session at History Camp Boston, I was, I was fascinated at some of the details and they kind of came to life when I went to the, uh, the reenactment. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they start out with those individuals, right, coming through. Yes. Set the stage for us. Help people understand what was it like out in the countryside as opposed to, say, Boston at that time? That, that's a great question to start off with. Uh, and I'm going to go in reverse. I'm going to start with Boston and work out towards the countryside. Um, Boston, uh, on the eve of Lexington and Concord, the best way to describe it uh, was basically it was uh, – it was a tinderbox. Uh, you had loyalists who were attempting to escape the countryside from patriots uh, who were chasing them into Boston and uh, literally engaging in violent behavior against them. Uh, at the same time, you had uh, civilians inside of Boston who were trying to get out of the town uh, because of the presence of British soldiers, um, as well as um, uh, the fact that um, it, it was just not... Uh, politically safe for them to be there. Uh, when you start moving out into the countryside, uh, you're looking into an environment that is on a war footing. As early as, many people believe as early as October of 1777, it was probably actually even earlier by about September of uh, 1774. I think I said 1777, I apologize. By October and September of 1774, uh, you already had militia companies preparing for war. Uh, they are drilling. Uh, they are attempting to get as much ammunition as possible. Uh, you have uh, individuals who are being hired by their towns to make arms and equipment for the militiamen and minute companies uh, that men and boys are serving in. A uh, great example I always thought of was in the town of Lexington. Uh, we were able to identify uh, Jonathan Harrington, uh, who was uh, the father of the company Pfeiffer. He was making cartridge boxes for the uh, Lexington militia in 1774 and 1775. When you get up into Essex County, you actually had British deserters uh, who were training the militia and minute companies, uh, preparing them for war. Uh, and you, this was not just a man's job. Uh, there were uh, women and children that were involved in these operations as well. We have documentation of uh, uh, women making additional clothing. Uh, there's children and, and women who are helping to roll cartridges, melt lead into bullets. And you even get on to the, the religious side on the pulpit. Um, as um, Lord Hugh Earl Percy, a British general, uh, referred to the uh, Congregationalist ministers of uh, New England, he referred to them um, as the Black Regiment. And he felt that many of them were spewing sedition from the pulpit. And one person who, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit today is the Reverend Jonas Clark from Lexington. Um, he was a very, very, for the time, a very radical minister. And as early as 1769, he was preaching from the pulpit that New Englanders needed to prepare for war, because if you were not militarily ready, it was a sin. So this is the mindset that's going on. What you have in Boston, you have people who are desperate to get out, people who are desperate to get in. British troops everywhere, 
And then you have in the countryside that is at a full uh, military war footing uh, by March and April of 1775. And at that point, the, um, the, the, the British regulars really didn't travel out into the countryside, right? That was kind of hostile territory, essentially? It, it was hostile territory. There are rare instances where they did, uh, where an occasional regiment would go out to exercise. In other words, just to get them used to long distance marches. Of course, as soon as they did that, uh, the countryside was up in arms. You either had militia companies that would suddenly engage in observation from a nearby hill, uh, would engage in observation from perhaps a nearby roadway, just to make sure that this was just a exercise and not an actual military operation. But from the British perspective, and as well the loyalist side of Boston Neck, it was dangerous territory. Yeah. Was there something in particular about those two those two towns, and and what brought things to such a fever pitch that individuals in those towns were thinking, you know, we need to be making cartridge boxes, we need to be drilling and so forth? It, it's interesting you mention that because Lexington and Concord, for all purposes, were exact opposite towns. Uh, Concord was the one of the county seats. Uh, it's where uh, court sessions were held. Uh, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress for an extended period of time was holding its meetings in Concord. Uh, so Concord, and Concord was a very large town. Uh, Concord had approximately 1,500 residents in 1775 that were dispersed roughly amongst 250 families. By comparison, Lexington was a dairy town. Uh, they had 750 individuals, and I kind of half jokingly say in 400 cows, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the community that were only dispersed amongst 100 families. Uh, Concord uh, was seen as a, a relatively safe area uh, for Massachusetts Provincial Congress to operate, uh, as well as to use it as a supply depot in the event war broke out. It was far enough in the interior uh, so that um, it was theoretically safe uh, from a, a British operation, yet close enough to Boston that if they needed to disperse the supplies relatively quickly, they could. On top of that, Concord had uh, multiple militia companies and Minuteman companies uh, in the town, but Lexington didn't. Uh, as far as we know, Lexington only had one militia company and that was it. And there is this little myth uh, that is out there uh, that Lexington had a Minuteman company. And there actually is no evidence uh, whatsoever uh, that Lexington had a Minuteman company on April 19, 1775. It was just one large company formally known as the Lexington Training Band, informally known as Captain John Parker's company. But when you ask, uh, you know, what was the big difference? It came down once again to politics. Uh, Concord, for the most part, uh, was far more moderate than Lexington. Uh, Lexington, again, I had referenced the Reverend Jonas Clark. Uh, he was, uh, he came into uh, uh, serving as the town's minister in the late 1750s. Um, by the time of the Stamp Act crisis, uh, he is the political authority for the town. Uh, anytime the town would craft town resolutions or even res uh, respond with his own committee of correspondence, the Reverend Clark was actually uh, writing the correspondence. So by 1768, 1769, you are actually seeing um, a very radical and very borderline on seditious statements coming out of Lexington, uh, where they're arguing that they will utilize uh, everything short of violence to defend their, their uh, English liberties. But by comparison, uh, Concord was a little slower to the game. Uh, on the eve of the American Revolution, they had loyalists in the town, Lexington didn't. Uh, they had a larger population. Uh, their minister, uh, although eventually became uh, a fervent uh, patriot, at first uh, he wasn't as vocal uh, as the Reverend Clark was. Uh, so we have this setting uh, in, in uh, Middlesex County. These are the two extremes uh, that you're dealing with. You're dealing uh, at sort of the little beyond the halfway point out of Boston following the Bay Road. You have this radical town, Lexington. And then eventually you get to this much larger farmer farming community that's the county seat, Concord. So let's let's go to that night and, and, and let's also help folks with some of the geography. Now at historycamp.org slash online, we have links to a couple maps. So the mm -hmm. 
speaker, the first speaker in our series, was, was John Bell with his book, Road to Concord. And so we post a couple of maps. Those would be really helpful for folks uh, to, to really understand what it was like with, with uh, a Boston far different than it is today, geographically, uh, and, and give people a sense of, of what was involved in those, those troop movements and so forth. So <clears throat> what uh, helps also with the time. So the, 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 the ships were kind of unloaded, men were loaded into small boats. Yes, uh, th this was a, a, an increasingly uh, faster and faster chain of events as the night went on, April 18th, uh, 1775, which is the night before the battles of Lexington and Concord. About roughly about between 4 p.m. in the evening and 6 p.m. in the evening, you had a chain of events which set everything in motion. Uh, the first is the Royal Navy began to lower uh, its longboats uh, from its uh, warships into the water and were transporting uh, uh, transporting them over to Boston's waterfront. Uh, at the same time, approximately nine officers, British officers, uh, left by way of uh, Boston Neck and began riding uh, uh, along the Bay Road. Now, the Bay Road is the road uh, eventually that leads to Lexington and leads to Concord. Um, their mission, the nine officers, were to intercept any alarm riders, someone like Paul Revere, um, or uh, William Dawes, who were going out into the countryside to warn about the operation. Unfortunately, the operation was a nightmare from the beginning. Uh, the British Army assembled at 10 o'clock at night uh, along the shoreline uh, in Boston to be transported over. In theory, it was supposed to be one crossing. Uh, it would take approximately an hour to get them over, and they would have been marching by 11 o'clock at night. Unfortunately, the Royal Navy did not release enough longboats uh, to transport the troops. So as a result, uh, it took about two hours uh, to get the troops across. Meanwhile, uh, there's people in Boston who are watching this going on. Uh, eventually, Dr. Joseph Warren uh, sends word uh, to Paul Revere and William Dawes, and the famous rides begin. Uh, there is uh, the two lanterns that are hung from the Old North Church, and eventually Paul Revere himself rows across to uh, Charlestown and begins his famous ride towards Concord. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, William Dawes is coming across uh, Rocks, uh, uh, Boston Neck into Roxbury and is working his way also towards Concord as well. The British expedition, um, again, <laughs> continued to face many, many problems. And the problems were it, it just couldn't get started on time. Uh, as soon as they were all assembled at midnight uh, on Phipps Farm in Cambridge, they sat there for another two hours waiting for rations to be issued, rations they didn't need uh, for the day. Meanwhile, uh, going into the countryside, uh, it, it, get, it becomes uh, quite a, uh, I'm not gonna say an exciting event, but it becomes quite an emotional event uh, within the hours with uh, Dawes and, and Rivera arriving. And so, <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about what that, what that alarm kind of process is uh, what what happens from from one community or farm to the next, and uh, we we heard w uh, from John. You might want to just add to folks who missed that um, the the interception, Revere being dismounted, uh, but Dawes uh, what, uh, jumping his horse over uh, what uh, fences and into fields and, and escaping. Is that correct? Yes, if that that is correct. It's it, so just to back up, and I'm sure. Uh, John Bell, who, who, for those who are listening, is an amazing author, and I highly recommend his book, uh, as well as following his blog, Boston 1775. Um, but to back up with the alarm system, you basically had uh, three mechanisms for the alarm system. The first were the riders, the Paul Revere's, uh, the William Dawes up in Essex County, the Timothy Herricks, uh, who had basically a route that they were responsible for where along that route, they would notify uh, militia captains or town leaders about a potential British operation or movement. Then you had, as you got further out into the countryside, you also had alarm systems that were simply firing signal guns, firing a musket into the night. Uh, there are some references to some towns having bonfires or signal uh, towers that were being lit. And then finally, uh, you would uh, have uh, also uh, simply alarm bells, church bells uh, going off for the alarm system. So what happened when Revere and Dawes left, they had a twofold mission. Uh, their first mission was to get to Lexington. 
because staying in Lexington were two probably the most prominent members of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. Now keep in mind on April 18th, 1775, Provincial Congress is still meeting in Concord. But these two prominent individuals, uh, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, uh, were staying in um, Lexington. They were staying where? The Reverend Jonas, Jonas Clark's house. So Revere's first uh, alarm, uh, as well as Dawes, was to get to those two men because they were not sure whether or not um, uh, Adams and Hancock were secondary or primary targets of this British operation. Uh, their second uh, responsibility is after they alerted uh, the two men of what was going to happen was to ride on to Concord. Uh, now, this is where it starts getting a little crazy in Lexington, because when uh, Revere arrived, uh, a sergeant of the militia company in Lexington, a uh, William Monroe, had no idea who, who uh, Revere was. Never met him before, never heard of the man. So when he started riding uh, towards uh, the Hancock Clark House today in Lexington, but it was the Reverend Clark's uh, homestead then, uh, he's attempting to call out to get Hancock's and uh, Adam's attention. Uh, this sergeant, Sergeant Monroe, ordered him to uh, remain quiet, otherwise he's going to wake up everybody inside the house. And I should say, just for timeline's sake, this is roughly about 1130 midnight at night, uh, going into April 19th. And uh, the response from uh, Revere is basically noise. You're going to have enough noise shortly. The regulars are out. That triggered at that point a series of events. Um, but uh, Hancock, uh, excuse me, uh, Revere and uh, Dawes attempted to ride on to... Uh, Concord, they ended up meeting up with a, uh, a doctor who was returning from visiting his fiance, uh, a Dr. Prescott, uh, at which point uh, they encountered those nine British officers I mentioned before. And when those nine British officers had passed through Lexington earlier in the evening, the Lexington militia sent out a couple of riders to shadow them. Uh, unfortunately, these were older teenagers who might not have thought it out, and they were quickly captured. Uh, so when um, the uh, British uh, encountered Revere and uh, Dawes and Prescott, they already had two to three Lexington uh, teenagers uh, in their custody as well. And as John Bell had described, uh, it, it became a little crazy. Uh, Mr. Dawes was uh, dismounted, but he escaped. Uh, Mr. Revere was captured, and Dr. Prescott was able to go on to Concord and alert the town what happened. It was, it was Prescott then, yeah. Uh, it is interesting, the, uh, the the descriptions from Revere, and I think these are the documents in the Massachusetts Historical Society, where he tells someone, right, and then writes down his account, that uh, the British officer, what, held his uh, gun to his head and said he'll blow his brains out. And yes, it was so interesting to read that, we think, oh, things were so different then, right? And you, you read yeah. that phrase and so forth, and you think, wait a minute, uh, anyway, so so this is fascinating. So the alarm has gone out. Now, there have been previous alarms, right? There have been other instances when there have been alarm riders and so forth? Yes, there, there, there had been other instances. There was the uh, there was an incident uh, in uh, September, October of 1774, where the British launched an operation uh, to a powder house in what is now uh, Somerville, uh, Massachusetts, I believe it was Medford at the time, where they seized uh, uh, weapons and uh, powder stored there. There's also the famed um, uh, Salem Affair, uh, where there was a British military operation in February of 1775 that landed in Marblehead, and they marched uh, to Salem. Um, it was a very tense situation because there was a standoff with Essex County Militia, uh, but it, eventually there, there was a resolution to the matter. Uh, so th it's fair to say the entire countryside was very, very tense and very nervous uh, about any potential um, operations that could be taking place. So, so, so this night, the um, residents are awoken or they hear the alarm. What do they do? Both, both men that, that maybe head to the green as well yeah. as uh, a, a wife, a, a, a son, a daughter left behind. This, this, is, this is where it becomes interesting, where, where it really went into my research, because the history books, for the most part, focus on the role of Captain John Parker's company. How did the men react uh, to the operation? And the, um, it, basically what happened was there were multiple times that uh, John Parker's militia company assembled between midnight and 5 a.m. when the battle took place. 
um, they assembled uh, and they was a debate. Is it possible the British are really out? Is this just another marching exercise? What's going on? So they decided to send a pair of scouts, uh, three scouts total, uh, back towards Boston following along the Bay Road to see if they could see anybody. They also sent some alarm riders of their own to the neighboring town of Bedford to at least alert them saying there may be an operation uh, in play. But the interesting thing which has been overlooked is the reaction from the civilian population. Now keep in mind from the civilian population's view at this time, uh, the British Army is viewed quite negatively. Uh, they are seen as rogues, uh, they are seen as immoral, uh, and there's a belief um, that they are looking to provoke a war in order to enslave the Massachusetts population. And this is a, um, a theory that uh, was quite often uh, uh, proposed by Hancock and Adams and many members of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, but on top of that is being preached from the pulpit uh, by the Reverend Clark. So as a result, by about one o'clock in the morning, a massive panic uh, has actually uh, set into uh, the town. Uh, and as a result, the women and children who are along the Bay Road, who are along, who live along the Lexington Common, um, are preparing to flee their homes. And there is an account um, from Anna Monroe, and we will talk about Anna Monroe uh, a few times during uh, this conversation. She is the wife of that sergeant who challenged uh, Paul Revere. And she described how as the alarm is going off and she's preparing to flee into the night, uh, she's crying uh, because she's baking bread for her husband's because she believes he's going off on a military campaign and she doesn't know if she's ever gonna bake bread for him again. There are accounts of women who are between eight months pregnant and who had recently delivered children who were being carried out by sons and, and husbands and daughters uh, or mothers just to carry them to safety. Uh, families are, are getting up by the entire family with the exception of the men and fleeing into the woods, uh, fleeing down towards the Bedford line, uh, fleeing down towards the Woburn line just to get out of the way because there is this perception that if a conflict breaks out, the British are just going to either slaughter them um, or they are actually going to um, uh, completely decimate uh, their homes, burn the homes to the ground, pillage the homes and destroy everything. So this is the mindset that's going on in the early morning of April 19th. I'm fascinating. So, so just play that on forward through, through the morning. Uh, sure. So the, the other thing I should mention is what a lot of the women were doing uh, as they get ready to flee. They're taking their personal property and either they're carrying it off with them or they're burying it at a place where they think that the British soldiers won't be able to find. And the reason that is happening is because under 18th century colonial law, when a woman marries, about 99% of a woman's belongings goes to the man. Uh, it becomes part of the marital estate, in other words, his property. However, under Massachusetts colonial law, uh, certain housewares, uh, including fabric, um, utensils, candlesticks, um, plates, uh, things along those lines are considered to be part of uh, the domestic belongings and as a result uh, belong to uh, the women, uh, whether it was the mother-daughter, uh, mother-in-law uh, and daughter. So we have multiple accounts uh, of women who are burying their property uh, before they uh, flee. The Loring family uh, did this. Uh, we also have the Parker family that uh, did this. So as they're fleeing away, um, it is actually now the Lexington militia uh, is sort of in a waiting game. And by about four o'clock in the morning, the two out of the three uh, scouts have returned. And their report is just nobody on the road. Uh, what they don't know uh, is the British Army is actually now in Monotomy, which is a district of Cambridge. And they're about an hour away. Around five o'clock in the morning, um, the final uh, alarm rider uh, comes riding up and he is screaming that the regulars are on the road and they're only a short distance away. So um, so now we have a point where uh, there's gonna be a confrontation. Uh, and as we're all familiar, the Battle of Lexington took place. And unfortunately, uh, Lexington lost uh, and sustained heavy, heavy casualties. Uh, you had eight killed and 10 wounded uh, during that uh, engagement. Uh, that lasted less than five minutes uh, during the fight. Well, the thing was, because Lexington and all of most uh, most of Massachusetts was deforested at the time, uh, 
Uh, families who are hiding uh, out on the Bedford line, out on the Woburn line, or hiding somewhere away from the battle can actually hear the engagement. And there is an account of uh, Captain John Parker's wife sending her younger um, uh, son, who was below the age and was not required to serve in the militia at the time, to a nearby hill that would look down towards the green to see what would happen and to see if the British were actually looting the houses and burning. When the British moved on, uh, you had two things actually happen. Uh, there was, and I refer to this, you're now at the, the very uh, tail end of what I refer to as the first evacuation, uh, which took place from midnight up until a little bit after the Battle of Lexington. Uh, it, during this stage, uh, Lexington families are now coming to the green and seeing the horror of, of what had happened. Uh, and they're in the process of trying to actually understand and, and comprehend what had taken place and what happens next. Meanwhile, the British Army is moving towards Concord, and the word is spreading uh, that there was an engagement in Lexington. So now you start seeing families in Lincoln and families in Concord doing the exact same thing uh, that had happened. They are now fleeing uh, as well. And there's an account of uh, Mary Hartwell uh, in Lincoln who described that uh, basically as they fled the house, uh, they made sure uh, that the cattle uh, were not in the barn anymore because they were afraid that the British were going to burn the homestead down, burn the barns down, and destroy all the livestock uh, inside of it. It is a description uh, by her about how women and, and young family members were all hidden uh, together uh, in, the, uh, in the woods, and occasionally uh, one of them would brave to go out and look to see whether or not the British were there, the British were coming back. There's a brief lull uh, between the first evacuation and the second evacuation, which I, I place roughly at about 10 a.m., 11 a.m. in the morning. Uh, this is after the Battle of Concord, where now the uh, residents between Concord and Boston are realizing they're coming back. The British Army is now has to retreat back uh, through uh, the towns that they originally marched. And this is where a massive panic uh, actually takes place. Uh, the Reverend William Gordon, uh, who was a Congregationalist minister, traveled uh, through the battle site. Um, as they traveled through the two, uh, uh, as he traveled to the, the, the two battle sites the next day on April 20th, he interviewed um, uh, various witnesses as to what uh, happened. And he was able to actually put in, in great detail the, the second evacuation, where he described, according to witnesses telling him, that the Boston Road was clogged with women and children who were weeping and in, in terror about this British uh, army that was going to be returning through their town. Now, to complicate matters, while you have this massive civilian flight that is actually taking place, you also have, uh, in addition to uh, this, you have militia companies and minute companies that are trying to get into, uh, into position to attack the retreating regulars. So you have all of this uh, going on. And an interesting uh, question I received uh, was, well, is this just women and children that were, were fleeing? We were all the men off and uh, uh, fighting. And what I found was there actually were men uh, who were part of the evacuation. And they were broken down into basically four categories. Uh, first category I found were ministers. They uh, actually don't get the credit they should that this is a time when they were sort of stepping up to the plate to tend to their flock, get them to safety and to provide them with uh, spiritual courage during this time. So people like uh, Reverend uh, uh, Clark were actually leading some of the congregation to safety. The second batch of uh, men were those who were ill or infirm. Um, and th those were various individuals I've been able to identify. They were either sick, identified as lame, and, and therefore could not participate in the militia. But the, uh, the third category were men uh, who were actually either guarding British prisoners uh, and therefore off in some other location. Usually I found documentation for them being in, in remote parts of Lexington or Woburn. But it's the fourth category, uh, which uh, are men who actually stayed with their uh, wives or their daughters uh, to make sure that they were safe. And it was usually those men or women um, who were, uh, excuse me, those, those women who had recently given birth. Uh, we, we do have one, uh, Joseph Esterbrook. Uh, there is some debate whether or not he actually fought on April 19th, but there is an account uh, 
that he and his father carried his mother, who had just given birth to a child, in a chair to safety and remained with them to, uh, to protect her. Uh, there is the account of the Reed family, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sarah Reed's uh, parents, as well as her husband, carried her out in a mattress uh, just to get her to safety. So it was definitely uh, on top of that. Um, you have um, uh, men who, who stayed as part of this uh, evacuation as well. And, and the final thought before I, I sort of shift just to give you the, the af not the aftermath, but at least the, as we get towards the day, just to show you how horrifying it was. Uh, there's an account from a Reverend uh, David McClure, um, and he was from Needham, Massachusetts, and the Needham militia are marching towards war. And keep in mind, you have militia companies who, and minute companies who are trying to enter the fray, civilian families that are trying to get out of the fray. And this militia company actually describes that they can follow the path of the British Army by the smoke they see from the houses they're burning. This is the type of scenario that they're actually uh, getting uh, into. And my final two thoughts, just to give you as, as this is continuing, when you got by the point when the British came back through Lexington, they devastated Lexington. Uh, this is probably about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, they are now burning homes. Uh, they fired an artillery piece uh, through the town meeting house, which is also the town's church. By the time they get to Monotomy, which is a Cambridge district, fighting is hand to hand. Uh, most of the women and children by this point are completely uh, out of the fight. They are hiding in neighboring towns. Uh, they are hiding in various locations. And there is an account from a woman, and I apologize, her name escapes me, where she said she ended up in a house uh, hiding. Uh, it was in, uh, in the outskirts of monotomy. And they were hiding in the house uh, with approximately 80 women and children. And the 80 women and children were described as all weeping and wailing, unsure if their husbands are gonna return, unsure if their homes will still be standing. And uh, it, was, it was quite a, a terrifying event is the best way to describe it. But to complicate as a final thought, because I, I often get the question, well, what about enslaved people? What were they going through during this evacuation? And we do know that there were enslaved men who were fighting in the militia uh, on April 19th. Prince Esterbrook uh, of Lexington is probably one of the more uh, famed. Uh, Salem Poor is, is another individual. But, but some people ask, well, what about those enslaved people who, who were not fighting? What about them? We found out in my research, it took a lot of digging, uh, but the panic was so bad and people were so fear, fear, fearful that the British were gonna lay waste to everything um, that, um, that actually rumors started in Framingham, Massachusetts, and began to travel uh, sort of eastward towards monotony of a slave uprising, and that the slaves uh, were going to finish off uh, what the British had not. Uh, and there are accounts uh, of families hiding, arming themselves, waiting once the British were going to pass, that now the slave insurrection is going to take place. What really happened was, um, is many of the slaves risked their own lives to stay behind and protect the properties uh, and ensure that the British didn't devastate uh, or steal. There is an account of a Cambridge or monotomy uh, enslaved person uh, where the British attempted to torch his master's uh, uh, tavern. The man actually uh, risked his life, ran through the engagement with fire all around him, went into the structure and put the fire out, thereby saving the family's home. So these are the things that were actually going on throughout the entire day outside of the fighting that was taking place on April 19th. Well, that's fascinating. You know, <clears throat> I started by saying that there were two books that you'd written. And what I'm realizing, I'm seeing some of the questions, uh, we, we probably are going to be focused uh, and are just having time tonight for the for the first book, um, and we'll have to have you back and and talk about the sure. second. Um, a, a, a couple of things, and then I'll turn it over to uh, to Carrie. So, your book. Tell me, tell us the title of the book. That... The the book I, I wrote relative to April nineteenth is called "We Stood Our Ground: Lexington in the First Year of the American Revolution." Um, it's actually in its third edition currently. Well, that's great. And so people, if they're interested in that book, if they're interested in the signed copy, they can they can buy that at historycamp.org slash online. Uh, and then they'll also find uh, your second book. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about uh, what that covers? And like, sure. 
do a, a, a future yeah. one. Um, it's uh, it's called uh, I See Nothing But the Horrors of a Civil War. Uh, this is a book that examines the loyalist refugee experience uh, during the Saratoga campaign of 1777, as well as their experience inside refugee camps in Canada uh, following uh, the defeat of Burgoyne at Saratoga. You know, Alex, when we were talking in the, in the as soon as we were getting ready, that yes. phrase, refugee camps, I don't know that I've ever heard that or read that in the context of what was going on at, at this time. One, one associates it with, with modern affairs. Right. And, and it's one I, I, I have when I, when, I, when I have my own children and we talk about modern politics and when they talk about, for example, the, the Syri Syrian refugee crisis, I often point back to them and, and say, well, what about the American refugee experience? And I, I get a blank stare. Uh, this was a fascinating research project. It's, that started in 2010. Uh, where myself and a few other individuals were examining and looking into uh, a loyalist military unit called McAlpin's Corps of American Volunteers. And it shifted gears because I, I ended up stumbling across a uh, muster roll of uh, refugees. Uh, and I do call them refugees because that's what they were. They were escape escaping a war environment. Uh, loyalist refugees who were staying uh, in a uh, camp up in Canada uh, in Sorrel. And um, when I looked at the muster roll, I, I realized, and I had to do a couple of math calculations to make sure I, I was correct, I realized uh, upwards of 60% of the occupants were children. And you, you realize that, you're like, oh my God. Uh, and then I look at my daughter, uh, who is at the time, I think she may have been six or seven years old, and I'm trying to just fathom, you know, what would my daughter's experience be like inside of, of a loyalist refugee camp? And then I, I, I looked at it, uh, examined it even more, and what I discovered was the British government did not want them in Canada. Uh, they saw them as a nuisance. And so what they did is they relegated them to a series of camps. I think there were about six to eight camps that were located throughout the Quebec province. Uh, and these camps were run like uh, the poorhouses in England, um, where actually uh, the refugees, the women and children would have to work in exchange for shelter. And in preparation for tonight's discussion, I actually went back and looked at my old research notes, and I found out that in one camp, there were approximately about 200 uh, refugees, and they were all crammed in, in 12 houses uh, that were no more than about 18 feet uh, by 20 feet in size. Uh, food was severely rationed. There are accounts of mothers who are denying themselves food uh, so that their children can eat. Um, the refugees were prohibited from leaving uh, the camps uh, under the threat of arrest if they were. Uh, and, and this is what the refugees we discovered were going through uh, during, the, uh, uh, during their time up in Canada. It was a harrowing, harrowing experience. And the final sad point was uh, the, most of the Loyalist refugees uh, after the war uh, who remained in Canada uh, either went to the Ontario province or over towards the Canadian Maritime provinces. Um, the British government just wanted to expel them all from Canada uh, and just send them off to parts unknown. It, it took a pair of loyalists to petition very hard to, to get them to uh, allow them to uh, migrate westward to what is now referred to as Upper Canada or the Ontario province. Well, that's fascinating. And again, it's so interesting to me that you've taken two areas that I think most of us perhaps haven't given much thought to. And really <laughs> deep dive and, and they give us a much richer understanding of what took place. Yeah, you know, it's funny, again, preparing, uh, preparing for this interview, um, I did, it wasn't until you and I were, were talking about this the other day that I really thought about that, you know, my focus has become more on the, the civilian perspective in, in a wartime environment. And, and I'm probably gonna have to now expand upon it. That would be my next project to avoid yard work. Um, but it's, uh, it's one, yes, I, I've actually enjoyed it over the years. Um, you know, we could talk about military engagements, we can talk about muskets and redcoats, but I, I've really enjoyed ex looking into the civilian experience, the loyalist experience, uh, what was going on behind the scenes, or how did the war actually impact them? Um, because um, it, it doesn't get the attention that it so rightly uh, deserves. As I said, it certainly gives a person uh, a, a much fuller, uh, a true sense of, of what yes. was going on. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. I think we've got some questions and she's going to take us through those. And at the end of this evening, we've got an announcement about an event that's going to take place, a very different kind of event, one that 
folks who love history will really want to participate in this week, this time next week. All right, Carrie. All right, we've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, okay. One of them is in regards to the militia and yep. were they not serving alongside the regulars during the French and Indian War? So they were sort of heroic partners in war and now they're shooting at each other? That's an excellent question and an excellent point. Uh, there was a percentage of, um, of militiamen and Minutemen who did serve in the French and Indian War. Uh, not every militiaman, uh, not every Minuteman was a veteran of the French and Indian War. There were some that did serve. Uh, the interesting thing about when I looked at the Minutemen, uh, keep in mind the Minutemen is your rapid response unit. They're going to be the first ones to respond. Well, in your community, who are the fastest and most likely to, uh, most agile and able to assemble at a, a moment's notice? Your teenagers and your young twenty-somethings. That's what made up the militia, the Minuteman companies mostly. So they they really didn't have too much uh, experience. Their commanders may have. Uh, as for those who did serve, you had a variety of service uh, when they served in the French and Indian War. Uh, some uh, actually did see military combat and served in leadership roles. Others were more in a logistical support role. Uh, but there definitely was a um, a um, sort of this we were once on the same side now we're shooting each other relationship that obviously broke out once april 19th occurred right okay our uh, next question is about the lantern signal so who were the two lantern signals for revere already knew and dog was in the neck right so what it was actually it was a signal for uh revere's uh, i'll call them assistance for for less of a better term in charlestown uh, it was uh, to basically alert them uh, to prepare his uh, horse for uh, uh, for him to use to ride out to the countryside, as well as alert other alarm riders uh, as to that there is a British operation taking place uh, and the alarm riders need to dispatch immediately. Uh, interesting about the two lanterns, um, if, if you ever see the ceremonial service where it's done, I think they leave the lantern up for a couple of hours. The total time the lanterns were hung, 30 to, 60, 30 to 60 seconds tops, but it was enough to trigger the alarm system to uh, mobilize. Perfect, thank you. All right, I think we are about out of time, so if we didn't get to all your questions, we will try to get information to you yes. separately. Thank you so much, Alex, this has been fantastic, and I definitely think okay. we've got to have you back so that we I can learn more about loyalists, because that yes. is, something I have not heard either. And I think that is a fascinating subject to explore. I, I will definitely would love to, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, joining you guys in the near future at History Camp. Wonderful. So if you are interested in one or both of Alex's books, you can buy those on our site. And then he can also inscribe those and sign them to mm -hmm. you when they are sent out. Uh, now, as a reminder, if you have friends or you want to watch this again, you'll be able to look on our website, historycamp.org slash online. It will be posted there tomorrow. And that is where we will post all of our interviews the day after they are live. So you can see any of the old ones there as well. Now, next week, we have an exciting thing happening. We've been teaming up with our friends at Learning Plunge. And we're going to bring you a history trivia night. So get your friends together, get your teams set up, and then go to our website, historycamp.org slash online, and you can register there. You will have to register individually, but you can tell us who you want uh, to be on your team, and we'll get that all set up for you. So we're looking forward to that. That'll be May 7th, next Thursday at 8 p.m. And then we will be back with another interview on May 14th. We'll be speaking with Eric J. Dolan about his book, Le Leviathan, which is about the whaling in the New England area. So that's going to be very interesting. And then we will also get a sneak peek at his upcoming book, which is Furious Sky, the 500-year history of America's hurricanes. So we've got some interesting stuff coming up for you. We have a few more scheduled out and lots more in the works. So take a look at our website and you can see that there. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Good night. Thanks. Thank you.